Hey guys, Mike Dugan, your home improvement guru. You know, a herringbone floor is something that can add wow factor to any room. And if you don't mind spending a little bit of time to make it happen, you can lay a floor just like this one by using some basic tools and a little bit of know-how. Getting the tools is up to you, but I'm about to give you step-by-step -step instructions without skipping any steps. So let's get started. Start with some basic planning. Almost all flooring comes in bundles and lengths up to 7 feet long, but they can be as short as 12 to 15 inches. So if you're laying flooring conventionally in other rooms of the home, start setting aside the shorter boards you'll need for the herringbone room. Doing this also gives you a higher percentage of premium board lengths for the other rooms in the home. A real win-win. Now when buying flooring, don't cheap out by getting narrow board widths. While big box stores normally sell flooring that's two and a quarter inches wide, go for something a little more substantial. Yeah, it'll cost you a little more, but the difference is like night and day. Shoot for something at least four inches wide like I did here. Keep in mind too, that putting down herringbone is really labor intensive. So if you get stuff that's double the width, that means half the work. Okay, I'm begging you, use a border. There is no way you should go to all the trouble of laying a herringbone floor and not have a border. It's really a mortal sin not to have one. So as you put aside the lengths for the herringbone, don't forget to also set aside some longer lengths for the border. Theoretically, you could use some shorter ones, but aside from being that much more of a pain to install, they'll look terrible, trust me. Also, keep in mind that you should be bordering everything in the room. That means any fireplace, hearths, case openings, etc. besides the room itself. Okay, enough talk, let's get going. Start by cleaning out the room and making sure there are no high spots on the floor or any nails sticking out proud. In this job, a tile guy has got some thin set on the floor and I wound up going a little overboard and I took out the belt sander going over the whole floor. Yeah, I know it seems like overkill, but it only took about 15 minutes or so. Also, now is a good time to throw in some screws to ensure a squeak-free floor down the road. This floor was glue nailed down over TGI engineered joists, and it didn't squeak at all. But in my opinion, it's crazy to take chances. Just throw some screws in and you know you're good. Anyway, take the width of the border and add that to the thickness of what the baseboard will be that's going in the room, and then deduct a quarter of an inch. This is where the border will meet the inside part of the floor and will give you as wide of a border as possible while ensuring a small amount of overlap at the baseboard. You want to create a chalk line using this number. In this case, I was using a four inch border and had one inch thick base. So I made a block that was four and three quarter inches wide. By the way, you'll notice that the block that I made is square. Usually I'll make jig like this square so there's no chance of making a mistake if it gets turned as I work. Make marks at all the inside and outside corners of the room, taking care to mark off the sheetrock, not the plate. After the marks are made, connect the dots using a chalk line. Now see if there are any nails under that chalk line. If so, set them really deep, like about a quarter of an inch or so, so you don't wind up cutting into them later when you trim for the border. Once any nails are set, go around and tape off the perimeter. I've got to admit, I went cheap here and used regular masking tape, and I was kind of sorry that I did, because when I came up later, I had to use the chisel to get it up off the floor in a few spots. I really should have used blue tape to make later removal easier. Anyway, the purpose of using tape is just to make sure you don't wind up accidentally gluing down the floor outside the border in case there's any squeeze out. Also, if you're using built-in floor grills, another thing I really recommend Tape these off as well. By the way, if you haven't done so already, now is a good time to take a can of black spray paint and give those floor ducts a quick shot. Seeing shiny metal through nice floor grills, not good. Earlier you estimated the length of boards you need, so now it's time to fine tune that number. At this point you should know how many rows of herringbone you're going to be using. So divide the net room width, in other words, the space from border to border, by that number and see how much width each row will take. That's easy enough to do with a calculator, but since the boards are at a 45 degree angle, figuring out how long the individual board should be is a little trickier. So instead of getting out the slide rule, just make a mock-up out of some scrap wood until you come up with the right size. 
Now, take your time in getting the spacing right. Ideally, you want to wind up with as close to a full board on the sides of the room as you can. But don't try to get it too close. In other words, the last thing you want to do is make the boards a tad too short and wind up with little triangles at the side. That would not be good. Also, keep in mind that you really want to use an even number of courses for the floor. Having an even number makes the course on the left side mirror the course on the right side, which is definitely the way to go. All that said, I laid out this room a little differently. This is the master bedroom and there's an adjacent sitting room that's off center with the bedroom. Since the sitting room is what draws the eye when looking into the room, I wanted to make this the center line. This resulted in the boards on the far left and right side of the room being a little different in width, but I just made sure that the lengths I was using got me a decent size board at each side and everything came out fine. Now that you know how many courses you're going to be using, it's time to snap a chalk line to follow for the first run of boards. You might think that that line should be in the exact middle of the room. That's a perfectly logical and reasonable assumption, but it's also completely wrong. Take a look at the photo when you'll see what I'm talking about. The true room center is actually aligned with the center of each board, right here. But that doesn't help us very much because we need to create a chalk line that allows us to use the corner of the board as a guide. So in this case, my mock-up told me that the distance from the corner of one board to the corner of the other board was two and seven eighths. Half of that distance is an inch and seven sixteenths. So what I wound up doing was snapping a chalk line that was actually an inch and seven sixteenths offset from the room's true center. Okay, now that the brain work is behind us, let's start cutting some wood. The first step is to cut all of the boards you're going to need to their final length. This is a critical step. So put a brand new blade into the chop saw and make sure it's cutting dead square and rig a stop block that will not move. It's okay if you don't cut everything in one shot. You just don't even think about moving that stop block until everything is cut or you're going to be in for a world of hurt later if you get even a slight variation in board length. While it's technically not vital, I wanted to make all my boards a nice number. In the unlikely event that I had to go against what I just said and recreate my stop location. I also took one of the first boards I cut and marked it template and put it on the side as a precaution. All this cutting can be mesmerizing work, so as you cut, make sure you check every so often that you're cutting exactly where you're supposed to be and that stop block hasn't moved. By the way, be sure that you create a bevel on that stop block so that the sawdust has somewhere to go. Otherwise, you'll wind up hyperventilating as you go to blow off the excess sawdust after each cut. Also, when you cut, make sure that you cut the tongue side of the board off, leaving the groove side intact. If things worked out where you had to get two pieces out of a single long board, resulting in one piece that has no grooves on either end, that's no problem. Now that you have a bunch of boards cut to length, you need to run a slot down the end you just cut, winding up with all of your boards that are grooved on each end. Use a quarter inch wide slotting bit in the router and set it to mill the right depth and height. You want a groove that will mate perfectly with the existing tongues. I made up a quick jig here to get me the right cut, but in retrospect, it would have been a lot easier if I'd taken the time to set up a router table. Believe me, all that router handling can get pretty tiring after a while. After you've made all the grooves, you need to make up a bunch of short splines. You can use scrap for the purpose here. I use some scrap poplar. These can be slightly loose because the construction adhesive we'll be using will fill any gaps. Chop them to length, not worrying if they're a little bit short, just as long as none of them are too long. Take a piece of scrap plywood that you know to be exactly 90 degrees and set it down with the point right on top of your chalk line. Pre-drill and put in a screw near the point of this guide and then pivot it as needed to ensure that it's aligned square to the room. Secure it with a second screw so it can't pivot anymore, but before you actually glue or nail anything down, put in a few boards as a dry fit to make sure that they stay true to the chalk line. If they start to veer off, then you will probably a little bit off when lining up the triangle. Fix it if need be, and then put in a bunch of screws to hold it securely so it doesn't move once you start hammering against it. 
Now, this is important. Remember that while you'll be putting down two rows in this first step, only one side will be aligned with your chalk line. Because of this, it definitely matters which board you put down first against that triangle. Because if you make a mistake, the floor will not be centered in the room. One other quick thought on where to place this locator triangle when you start the process. Aside from figuring out how to center it in the room, you need to give some thought to how far away from the wall it will be. Keep in mind that while the left and right sides of the room will have pretty close to a full length board where they meet the border, the front and back of the room will have small pieces where they meet the border. So position your starter triangle in such a way that you wind up with a nearly full, well, baby triangle for lack of a better term, running along the border. I'll return to this point later when I can show you a picture of what I'm talking about. It'll be clear then, so don't worry. Usually when wood flooring is glued down, it's done with a trowel and a bucket of glue. This is the cheapest way for sure, but I preferred the control that large tubes of construction adhesive gave me. Here, I put the first few boards face up on a flat surface and shot some glue into the bottom of the grooved end. Then I flipped them over and hit the top of the grooved end and the bottom of the board itself with a few beads of glue. Once you're happy with how everything is lining up, start putting down flooring, <laughs> finally. Apply glue to the first two boards and nail them down with the flooring gun. Since there's no way to nail the groove side, for now we'll just clamp it down with screws and scrap wood until the construction adhesive dries. Use three to four nails per board depending on the board length. After the first nail is in, the board may shift a little bit, but it's quick work with the rubber end of the mallet to persuade it into correct alignment. Continue in the same alternating pattern as you work to the opposite end of the room. Obviously, it's imperative that you keep the corner of the leading board in line with the chalk line at all times. Also, just a quick comment about glue squeeze out. When putting down a conventional floor, it really doesn't matter, but herringbone is different, so be mindful of that last four inches of each board. If any adhesive manages to squeeze out here, it'll harden and make your life miserable later on. Once you've reached the other end of the room, it's time to start back the other way. Don't worry about cutting pieces to shorter lengths to get all the way into the border at this point. We'll fill in these areas later. For now, as soon as you reach the point of putting down your last full board, screw a block of wood down to the floor that's perfectly square with the previous course. This will act as a backup when you begin nailing again. Like before, you don't want these first few boards to shift in any way. Initially, you put down alternating pairs of boards as you work your way across the room. From here on, you'll just be putting down one set of boards at a time. Apply to the board back, and the small spline that goes into the board ends is visible as well. Also, as you can see in this photo, I just laid the flooring right over the ducting. I didn't bother to mark it just yet, but believe me, I took care of all the ducts while there was still enough showing to know where to mark. I stressed earlier how it was vital to have all the boards the exact same length, but having them the same width is just as important. This was supposed to be four inch wide flooring across its face, and for the most part it was. But some boards were a little bit wider. Not much, mind you, but these kinds of variations tend to build on themselves pretty quickly with herringbone as opposed to conventional flooring. In this picture, you could see by this slight gap that this board is a little bit narrower than it should have been. If you string several of these together, you can see how this could become a major issue. Whereas if you had a few boards that were a little light or a little heavy on a regular floor, who cares? Here, I actually found myself sometimes needing to hunt for certain boards that were a little wider or a little narrower than usual. If I had to do it over again, I think I would have ripped about a 32nd of an inch off the grooved end of each board to ensure uniformity. Of course, I wouldn't want to rip off so much that the tongue side would bottom out, but just a little bit would have made a difference in my view. No, this is not an optical illusion. I have shown you this picture before. It's just that I forgot to take photos of this part of the operation, so I've got to improvise. Anyway, once all of the full pieces are laid, it's time to fill in the triangles at each end. At this point, all of the boards at the ends have their grooved side facing the wall.
So the first thing you'll need to do is cut a full length of spline so you can put in the next pieces with the tongue side facing the wall. You should be able to fit the nailing gun in for the first few boards, but after that, you'll need to rely on glue with scrap temporarily screwed down to the subfloor to act as clamps, as I showed you before. After the entire inside part is done, it's time to start dealing with the border. Again, I don't have any pictures of the process to show, but it's pretty straightforward. First, use the same spacer block you used earlier to establish the border, but now you're marking on top of the flooring. Once all of the ends are marked with pencil, use a chalk line to connect the dots, just like you did earlier. Now you'll need a circular saw set at the precise depth to cut the flooring at the border. Ideally, you're just looking to barely score the subfloor as you cut. Obviously, a nice sharp blade is a must, but having a straight edge for a guide is even more important. If you have a Festool circular saw with an aluminum guide, then you already know how heavenly that tool is. But if you don't, you can still get a decent cut using an 8 foot long plywood or MDF straight edge as a guide. If you make it wide enough, you can keep it from shifting as you cut because you'll be kneeling on it as you go. Use the circular saw wherever you can, and for any spots where you can't reach with the saw, switch to a router fitted with a straight bit. Inside corners are pretty rare, but if you have any, just use a chisel or a fine saw to square them off, taking care to back bevel these cuts a little bit just in case. After the cutting is done, you'll need to run a groove around the perimeter to accept the tongue of the border pieces. Use a quarter inch slotter that either has the bearing on top of the bit or no bearing at all, otherwise you won't be able to get the groove down low enough. If you're not using a bearing, you'll need to use a straight edge to make sure you don't go too deep into the groove. You don't want the shank of the bit rubbing on the wood. After grooving, just take the long pieces that you set aside earlier and start laying the border. The groove should have been set so when the tongue of the border piece is installed, everything is nice and flush. Glue down the border, taking care to miter the corners as you go, and use spacers and wedges between the wall and the border piece to close the joint nice and tight. Then use scrap wood and screws as makeshift clamps to hold down the outside of the border until the glue sets. Don't bother with cutting out any air ducts at this point. We'll deal with that in the next step. By the way, remember earlier when I said you had to lay that plywood triangle in such a way as to wind up with a, quote, full triangle at the edge? This is what I meant by that. The sides of the room will have nice long pieces where they meet the border, assuming you lay things out correctly. But the front and the back of the room will wind up with small pieces at the border. Since I was using four inch flooring, my best case scenario was to have four inch triangles here at the border. This is where it's important just how far from the wall you place that starter triangle. It's not too hard to get this correct in the front of the room, but it's almost impossible to predict how big these little triangles of flooring will be when you reach the other side. So just keep your fingers crossed. Again, sorry for the lack of pictures, but you've made it this far, so dealing with the air grills shouldn't present too much of a problem. Start with a laminate trimmer that has a fairly small base, outfitted with a quarter inch straight bit. Make up a rectangular jig, one that's big enough to compensate for the size of the router base. This jig should be made on the table saw and be made from a single piece of three quarter inch plywood. Start by cutting it intentionally a bit small and keep experimenting on scrap until you have a jig that will cut out a rectangle that's just a little bit smaller than the actual wood grill's frame. Position it where it needs to go and screw it down at the edge of the subfloor. Of course, this is all done before the baseboard is installed, which gives you extra room for your jig, plus gives you a place to screw down the floor without the screw hole showing. Make the cutout in four to five passes, taking a little bit of material off at a time. And by the way, a vacuum hookup here is really a must. After it's done, use a chisel or a fine saw to square off the inside corners and create a slight back bevel as you go. Now you need to custom fit each grill frame into the opening in the floor. You want it to make the openings in the floor a little bit smaller because not all of the grills are going to be consistent in size. This gives you a chance to custom fit each one perfectly. 
Use a table saw to trim the grills the long way and the chop saw to trim them the short way. In both cases, a slight bevel helps in sizing and installing the grills. Use construction adhesive to secure them, clamp with the same screws and scrap plywood technique that you used earlier. One last thought. Be sure to mark the bottom of each removable grill and its corresponding frame with a unique letter. The floor sanders will do the floors with the grills in place, but once the staining and finish is applied, the vented part of the grill will get removed and done by hand. You'll need a way to know which one goes where when the job is done. Thanks for watching.